Amen. I got something to say too. We got well, we we're being blessed, aren't we? Thank you, Jesus. Well, all those testimonies you heard, all what you heard today about the goodness of Jesus, it's all because one day Jesus walked out of that tomb. They thought they killed him, but he turned the whole thing loose. He walked out of that tomb. He walked out. Huh? Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Amen. And because of that, we're free. The freedom that Canaan talked about so beautifully, we're free. And you are enough. If you don't get anything else today, because of Jesus, you are enough. Some preachers think that Jesus started the work and we're to finish it. But no, we start at the finish line because Jesus said in John 19, 30, it is finished. The work is already done. Say, it is finished. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The work is done. What, what was finished? The old covenant, that Old Testament system was finished. That Old Testament system was a system of doing good to get good. You were blessed because of your obedience, because of your rule keeping, because of your keeping the commandments. And there, there weren't just the big 10, there were 613 laws. If you can pull that scripture up, if you have it, John 19, 30. Everybody say, it is finished. And the Bible says that the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. I believe a big old angel tore that thing. And what was finished, again, was the Old Testament, and Jesus ushered in the New Testament, the New Covenant. We are no longer obligated, required to keep commandments, the, the Ten Commandments, the 613, all that's finished. What was finished was another thing that was finished because of the cross, because of Jesus, what we call his finished work. The Holy Spirit doesn't come and go. Like David prayed when he sinned by uh, sleeping with another man's wife, Bathsheba, uh, he said, Lord, don't take your spirit from me. Because in the Old Testament, the spirit would come and go. He would remain if you did good. He would leave if you did bad. That prayer that David prayed is not a prayer for us here in this new covenant because in the new covenant, Jesus said, I will never leave you. We're not blessed in the New Testament because of your obedience. We're blessed because of Jesus' obedience, because of what he did. Hallelujah. Because the work is finished, you're blessed because of what Jesus did on the cross. So we are free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And the reason why we're free is because we're forgiven. We're forgiven because Jesus was judged in your place. Jesus solved the sin problem. He took all your sins on the cross, past, present, and future. That's what I want to talk about for a few moments. Let's go to John chapter 12, a very misunderstood verse. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. The subject here is judgment. We deserve to be judged for our sins. 
Somebody has to pay the price. God didn't sweep sin under the rug. He dealt with it by sending Jesus to the cross to take our sins. So Jesus was judged for our sins. So now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world, that's the enemy, the devil, be cast out? Jesus dealt with the devil on the cross. He destroyed, the Bible says, principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Remember the topic is judgment. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Now, this, this is an unfortunate translation. The word people, if you look it up in the original Greek, it's not there. The word people doesn't exist in the original Greek. It was added by the translators. Okay? There used to be a song we used to sing. Lift Jesus higher. Lift Jesus higher. Lift him up for the world to see. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Anybody remember that old school song? Lift Jesus high. See, that's not true. <laughs> yes, we're to lift Jesus up. But that's, that's based on this verse, and that's not what it's talking about. Actually, what it says is, if I'm lifted up, and I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible, if I'm lifted up, it's talking about Jesus being lifted up on the cross. I will draw all to myself. What's the subject? Judgment. When Jesus was lifted up on that cross, all judgment came on him. Sin was judged. All your sins, past, present, and future, I'm going to show you that in a moment, was judged in the body of Jesus on that cross. Some people think that we make light when we preach like this and preach about the grace of God that we're making Light of sin. No, we're not making light of sin. We're making much of Jesus. Because he walked out of that tomb. What Jesus did, listen to this. This is deep. What Jesus did on the cross, it worked. He did a, a perfect work on that cross. He said, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all the judgment for sin to myself. Look at John 3, 14. Compare that to this. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man, so must the Son of Man be what? Lifted up. What did he do? He drew all the all your guilt, all, all your shame, all your wrongdoing, all the wrongdoing you might do tomorrow. He took it. Thank you, Lord. Well, you know, I, I don't know about him taking all our future sin. Well, unless you're over 2,000 years old, all your sins were future on the cross. <laughs> Look at, in comparison to the Old Testament that he finished. Again, forget about Keeping the Ten Commandments. The Bible calls the Ten Commandments a minute, trying to keep that as a ministry of death and condemnation. Second Corinthians chapter 3. It's a ministry of death. It's a ministry of condemnation. Nobody could keep the law. The law was a temporary system. It was our, Galatians says, it was our tutor or, or um, our schoolmaster. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. To bring us to Christ. Once we're in Christ, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. We're no longer under, under, under the tutor. Christ is the end of the law, Romans says, to everyone who believes. 
Well, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. I know. He said that. He came to fulfill it. And he did it. He finished it. Look at Hebrews 7, verse 27. It says, he has no need. Say, he has no need. This is talking about Jesus. Like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily. They had to daily go in and offer sacrifices. And once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies to offer sacrifice for the sins of the people. All right? But he doesn't have to do that. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once. Because in the Old Testament, they, they presented, the high priest would present animals, bulls, and goats, and calves. But Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. And, and so Jesus went in with his own blood. All those Old Testament sacrifices were types and shadows. They were to give us a picture of Jesus. He did this once for you because you are included in all. He did this once for how many? All when he offered up himself. So if he dealt with all my sins, past, present, and future, what do I do? See, that's the big question, because religion always wants to give you a do-do list. And man, it'll make you tired. And I used, to, I used to be a part of that. I raised my hand first. I used to be a part of that, giving people something to do. And you know, human nature always wants to do something, to achieve something. A whole... And, and it goes against everything that you learn from a child. Like we're, we're in a, a system where everything, you, you're rewarded by your achievement. You, you take tests to, to see how much you learned and if you pass or fail. And you, you got to do this in order to achieve something. Okay? But the cross don't work like that. Jesus achieved everything for you. And religion always wants to get you to do something in order to be accepted by God. You do these things to be right with God. I mean, everybody wants to be right with God. But it's so simple that religious folks cannot handle it. They couldn't handle Jesus. All you got to do is, is follow him around, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Who were the people who gave Jesus all the trouble? It was religious people. The common people heard him gladly. They would be whispering and accusing him of stuff. Like, don't he know that woman he's talking to? The sinner. Well, the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. He said those that are well don't need the physician, but those that are sick. It was the religious folks that gave him all the trouble. He made stuff so too simple. And it's still true to this day. And the problem with, with religion, nobody tells you when it's enough. Well, you need to read more, read the Bible more. You need to pray more. You need to go to church more. You need to be on the usher board. You need to be in a choir. You need to do, you need to, you need to, you need to. We need to see you more in church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I ain't seen you in, 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 in three, four months. Now, you know, your mother be ashamed of you. <laughs> and put guilt and condemnation on you. Now, I'm not against praying. I prayed this morning. Huh? I'm not against reading the Bible. We should do all those things. Go into church, but not because we have to. Because we want to. See, when you're born again, when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, the Holy Spirit is your regulator. He's your, your guide. He's your teacher. He will lead you. See, 
We need to trust the Holy Spirit. You, you, you don't need a, a Barney Fife. Some of you, uh, that's an old school reference. I, I don't know. But Barney Fife and Andy Griffin, I mean, he run around. Uh, he tried to throw his authority around. He had a, a gun with, with one bullet in his holster. And, uh, man, he, he tried to just, just get people to do this and do that. And he, uh, we need to get rid of the Barney Fives in the church. People to try to make you do right. You can't make people do right. Trust the Holy Spirit to guide people, to lead people into right living. When you understand the grace of God, you will live holier. I'm all about living a holy life. But I differ with religion on how to obtain it. Once you understand the finished work of Jesus and the grace of God, you will live holier on accident than you ever could on purpose. Well, what about sin? It's canceled. So what do we have to, again, the question, what do I have to do to be made right with God? Nothing. I'm here to tell you on Easter, there's nothing you have to do to be, be right with God. Just accept what Jesus did for you in his finished work. You are already accepted. You are already loved. You are already approved. You are not guilty. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You are well-pleasing to God. Because of Jesus. And when you get a hold of that and just receive that, what's my response to this, to this work on the cross? It's wow and thank you. That's it. And going about your business, then you're going to want to read your Bible. You're going to run to church. You're going to invite people. <clears throat> like a good restaurant. Man, whether you realize or not, you're feasting right now. It, it, it's, re it's refreshing to hear the good news. It's the, the gospel is good news. It's not bad news. It's amazing how backwards religion has it. They get mad at people like my friend Joel Osteen. They, they, get, they get mad at him because he smiled too much. Now, how backwards is that? We're supposed to be preaching good news. It's a happy gospel with a happy God. God's not tripping. And he loves you unconditionally. It's not based on your performance. God's love for you, his favor on your life is not based on your performance. It's all because of him and what he did. And when you really understand that, when you really, really understand and get a hold of that, you're going to love him and you're going to love others as a response, as a, as, as a response to his amazing love for you. First John says, herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. It's not about your love for God, it's about his love for you. He, because of his finished work, made you righteous. <laughs> he did it once offered himself one time. One time. Say one time. For me. Hebrews 10, 11. And every priest stands daily at his servant's service. Talk about an old covenant. Hebrews does a masterful job at, at contrasting the Old Testament that Jesus finished and this new covenant that Jesus has ushered us into. In the Old Testament, every priest stands daily at his service offering, what? Repeatedly, the same sacrifices, again, animal sacrifices, which could never take away sins. But Jesus was lifted up. But when Christ had offered for all time, 
There you go. Past. See, what is time? Past, present, and future. If you don't have past, present, and future, you don't have time. Okay? If y'all don't understand that, I ain't got time for you. <laughs> past, <laughs> present, and future. See, Christ offered for all time a single, there, there that is again, once for all, a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down. He not only walked out of that tomb, he's now seated at the right hand of the Father where we're seated together with him. Everything that Jesus did for, everything that Jesus did on the cross, none of it was for himself, all of it was for us. He offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, and he sat down. He sat down because it was finished. Ain't no more sacrifices because it was good for all time. It was good for past, present, future sins. Not just the sins that you committed before you got saved, but also the sins that you may have committed last night Tomorrow, next week, next month. Because come on, y'all, all of us sin. Huh? Even the preacher. Somebody like that. <laughs> but it's true. And then we'll walk around, act, act like, it, like, like, like we perfect. The good news is our sins have been canceled. So that makes us free. It don't make you want to go sin more. Not if you're born again. When you're born again, again, the Holy Spirit doesn't come and go. He will never leave you or forsake you. He's in you to lead you, to guide you, to direct you, to lead you down the right path. Huh? He don't get mad at you. Now, you can get turned around and, and keep running in circles if you want to, but he'll just gently see the Holy Spirit. Well, he'll, he'll just, he'll just, the Holy Spirit just got all over me, and, and he just made me miserable. No, there's nothing in the Bible that says that. He's kind of like the GPS system. Like if you, if you have a, like a nav system on, like on your smartphone or in your car, when you make a wrong turn, it'll just tell you, go to the next exit, go uh, two miles, um, get off on this exit, turn left. Huh? Aren't you glad your naviga navigation system don't act like some of your friends? You idiot. I told you to turn left. <laughs> I ain't telling you no more. You on your own. The whole Holy Spirit's not like that. Aren't you glad? Huh? He'll just tell you, go, go to, uh, two more miles, turn left, take the next exit. And you can run around all day if you want to. But that, that, that voice will never get mad at you. It'll keep, it'll keep giving you directions. For the rest of the day, if you want to ride around in circles all day. Huh? I wish we had nav system. Well, when I was in college, I had an uncle, Uncle Chester. And Uncle Chester was supposed to, he was taking me to Ball State. Some reason my parents couldn't, couldn't take me. And so I kind of fell asleep. And we had, we had been riding for probably 40, 45 minutes. And we're going to Muncie, and he said, uh, are we in Muncie yet? I looked up, and it was Bishop Lewis High School. I never will forget. It was, we were right on, on par, and it was at Bishop Lewis. I was like, man, what have we been doing <laughs> for 45 minutes? I think about that a lot. Whenever I'm over there on par, <laughs> then. 
You didn't have the nav system back then. Huh? Anyway, how did I get, get up on that? The Holy Spirit is not going to get on your case. He's going to gently lead you. He's your helper. Huh? Well, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will convict you. No, the Bible says that he will convict. He will, the word convict in the Greek means to convince. He will convince the world of sin. He's going to convict the world, convince the world that they need a Savior. Then he goes on to say he will convict the world of sin and then of righteousness. That's for the believer. He convicts the believer of righteousness. The Holy Spirit convinces you, convicts you that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, which means you're accepted, you're approved, you're not guilty. You are well-pleasing to God. Oh, Pastor, you don't know how much I messed up, man. I'm, I, I messed up. I messed up bad. You don't know what I did. I, I, I messed my marriage up. I, I screwed up, man. I, I blew my marriage. I blew it. Jesus took care of that on the cross. So receive his love for you. Receive, receive your forgiveness. It was, it was my fault. He took your faults. I'm ashamed. He took your shame. What else? What else did you do? It's covered. That's what I'm trying to tell you. He offered a single sacrifice for that broken marriage that was your fault. Hmm? And he sat down because the work is finished. Just receive his forgiveness. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Let me, let me wrap this up. Hebrews 9, 25. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with, with blood, not his own. But then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared, here it is again, once. That's a little small up there, isn't it? That's all right. It's in your Bible. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin. He put it away. That mess that you made, he put it away. <laughs> Pastor, you don't know how much I'm... He put it away. Man, this is so good. He put it away by the sacrifice of himself. Just, and just, oh, this is so good. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered, how many times? See this same theme over and over. Offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time. He's coming back, y'all. Not, look at this, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. He's coming back not to deal with sin. You know why? Because he already dealt with it in his finished work on the cross. When he was lifted up, he drew all the judgment of all your sins, past, present, and future. He took your place. He took your judgment. He drew all the judgment to himself so we can be free. And that's freedom. Freedom is not going through seven steps or 12-step program. Freedom is understanding and receiving what Jesus did for you on the cross. 
I cringe when I hear people in the 12-step pro. You, you, you go in these programs and they have you identify with your problem. My name is Steve. Hi, Steve. Everybody say, hi, Steve. I'm an alcoholic. I have a drug addict. No, you're not. You're not an alcoholic. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm a recovering alcoholic. No, you are free. Jesus took that addiction. He took that bad habit. Receive your freedom. You got a drug problem? Here it is. Right before you get ready, get ready to uh, uh, smoke that weed or snort that coke, right before you do it, make sure it's right before, as close as you can get to when you're fixing to do it. When, you, when you're fixing to sniff or uh, 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 smoke, say this, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, Pastor, that, that's just... You listen to that preacher, you just need to stop going to that church and tell you to take drugs. I'm not telling you to take drugs, you're going to do it anyway. I'm telling you what to do. Those of you that, that, that you have that habit, you have that addiction, before you do it, say what I'm doing is I'm helping you by pointing you to your identity. You are not that habit. You're not what you're doing. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You, if you're going to do it anyway, say this. If you keep doing it, every time you do it, right before you're getting ready to commit adultery with that woman that you know you ain't got no business with, right before you get ready to do your thing, when you're butt naked, say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you keep doing that, you're going to keep your clothes on eventually. More than that, you're going to stay away from our house. You, you, you're not going to reach for the phone and send that text. You're going to be free. You, you, you're not going to have to look over your shoulder anymore and make sure you wipe out all the messages so your wife won't see it. You're going to live a free life. The, the church that sinned the most, the Corinthian church, where a dude would, would sleep with his father's wife. Deep stuff. You know what Paul would do? You better do right. No, he pointed them to their identity. What did he tell them? He said, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? See, when, when, when you identify, not... I'm an alcoholic. Or I'm a recovering alcoholic. No, you say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's who I am. You keep saying it, and you keep saying it, and you keep saying it, and you keep saying it. Hmm? Nobody stopped me from, Tracy was talking about the club. You, you don't have to stop going to the club. Nobody stopped me from going to the club. I still remember. I can see the parking lot. I don't remember the place. I can I remember the parking lot. The parking lot was where I was walking out when I de determined I didn't want to do that anymore. And nobody told me to stop. I was getting in the Word, man. I was praying and, and, and reading my Bible. But my routine, my habit was, was still the same. I still had the same behavioral pattern. It's Friday night. Come on now, I got paid. Huh? Yeah. You ready to go out? Go in the club, try to hit on the women, but I didn't have it no more. I didn't have my swag. I didn't have, 
I didn't have that no more. I just, it didn't feel right. Something, or something didn't, wasn't right about doing my normal thing. And I won't go, get into the, the whole thing. But my point is I walked out early. Huh? Man, back in them days, well, I guess I don't know what they do now. I mean, you wouldn't even go, you wouldn't even show up until about 11 o'clock. Then I'm, I'm leaving early, it's like 12 o'clock, whatever it is, because I was, I, I was like a fish out of water. I was like, I don't belong here. Nobody taught me to like, man, don't go to that, don't go to that club. See, the problem with the law is, is, is you, you want to do it. See, the Bible says the strength of the sin is the strength of sin is the law. When when the law is preached, you it makes you want to you it, it makes you want to do it. It causes you to sin more. Tell somebody not to do it, huh? It's something about the law. That's the principle of the law. It's a principle, huh? If I said, make sure your kids don't get up on this stage, kids do not get up on this stage. Anybody? All you young people, don't, you, know, you know, young kids, don't come up on the stage. They won't even think about the stage until I said something. Then everybody, then they start thinking about coming up on the stage. Because that's the principle of the law. All right. That's all. I, I, I have more, but that's all right. I think I'm done. 